The Soybean School on RealAgriculture.com is brought to you by Pride Seeds, Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans, and High Stick NT. Agriculture.com back again with Horace Bonner. I'm going to talk a little bit about soybeans. Uh, last time we talked about 2014, what happened this year. Um, I want to talk now about 2015 and uh, what's going to happen next year. Of course, if you know the answers, <laughs> well, I got well, a job for you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Everybody. But I, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is um, you know Peter Johnson didn't get as much wheat in as he as yeah, like. that's that right. means. That's right. And unfortunately, but that means there's going to be a lot of soybean acres out there. What does that mean for growers? I mean, you know, as I say, maybe a lot of unintended soybean acres. Yeah, you don't know. You're absolutely right. One thing we know for sure, you know, 2014 we had three million acres. And uh, it looks like 2015 will have even more, just because of the way it's it's shaking out with rotations. And so, as you as you think about that, and you tighten up your crop rotation, of course, what that means is you've got more disease potential. And every time you uh, grow more and more soybeans, uh, because they're such a big uh, consumer of both phosphorus and potassium. That's something else we need to think about, right? So it's nutrients and disease control. Mm -hmm. Those are two big ones. And, and the third one, if you've got soybean cyst nematode, where I've seen the big disasters in uh, second year beans or more beans in the rotation, is if you've got a lot of soybean cyst nematode, right? And that's where you can really get mm -hmm. hammered. Let's talk about feeding those soybeans. Yep. You mentioned you know, potassium is going to play a big role. Yep. And uh, again, a great an opportunity and a need to feed soybeans. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, as we've spoken about before, soybeans have a reputation for not needing extra fertilizer, and that's absolutely true if the soil test is good. Mm -hmm. The problem with Ontario is that so much, so much of Ontario is is low or be or getting low uh, because of some of the higher yields we've been pulling off, and in trials that we have uh, in, had in 2014. We had some of the biggest responses I've ever seen in soybeans, um, where we put no fertilizer, either broadcast or through the planter, 46 bushels, mm -hmm. where we, which doesn't sound that bad, until you compare it to where we put fertilizer, 57 bushels, right? So uh, that's the extreme. That's the extreme. I mean, most of the time we don't see those kind of wild swings in soybean production, but surely. Uh, it's been a good reminder that potassium is absolutely key, yeah. right? Let's talk about white mold for a second. Um, always a big challenge. Um, anything we learned this year about how to manage white mold? Well, I always talk about variable rate seeding. Mm. And stuff like that. Yeah. Any tips on what, how to tackle that next year based on what we've learned this year? Yeah, so I think actually the future for soybean seeding is variable rate because we know that uh, there's a huge difference in uh, the number of plants that you need dependent, uh, dependent largely on how tall they grow and how lush they grow. And different parts of the field can handle more or fewer soybean plants. And so at the end of the day, what I'm getting at is um, you want the minimum number of plants to achieve the maximum yield. Right, because as soon as you have too many, like we saw in 2014, they start to fall over on you, and you get white mold, and you end up with lower yields. So all that to say is, if you've got a field that had white mold, we would always recommend that in subsequent years you reduce your seeding rate to 150,000, even in 15-inch rows, 150,000 is lots in those fields, right? And if you've got wider rows, even less. Um, so seeding rate. Variety selection is a big one because the tolerance difference in, yeah. in white mold is tre tremendous. Uh, but the biggest one we learned this year, we, we kind of have known that for years, right? We, we know how to uh, do some of the cultural practices like wider rows, lower populations, those kind of things. Um, but what, what we're getting a better handle on is how to use some of these fuller, foliar fungicides, right? And so we had some nice trials out this year. We had six, and uh, of those, uh, four had pretty decent white mold pressure, two had really heavy white mold pressure. At the end of the day, where we sprayed a foliar fungicide twice, right, it starts to add up mm -hmm. in terms of cost, 
But where we had white mold, we had up to a nine bushel response, which I've never seen before wow. in, my, in my career, uh, to foliar fungicides. Not with one application, but with enough. two, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's still a lot to learn, uh, but I think that these foliar fungicides in a white mold year do have something to bring to the table, mm -hmm. right? Where 20 or 30 years ago, we would have said, we don't really have any foliar fungicides that uh, can be used economically to help us out, right? So you're, you're actually getting more tools in the toolbox, sir. I think so. I think we're getting, uh, we're getting closer to having something that can at least be a help. I want to make it very clear, these things are suppression. We cannot control white mold if it gets out of control, right? Yeah. We're talking about a help to try and bring us through the season if it ends up being a white mold year. Mm. Hey, final question. Um, always, we're always pushing soybean acreages norther, yeah. more further north, new yeah. ground. Any thoughts on uh, you know, growers being successful? What, what do you need to do mm. sort of to yeah. move into some of that new ground? Well, you know, we had 3 million acres, we're going to have more, and part of that is, of course, uh, soybeans going further north just because of the economics and, and some more land opening up. And let's be honest, it's a challenge. I mean, it's a challenge to grow soybeans in, in a tough year in southwestern Ontario. It is a much greater challenge as you move further north. So we don't have the answers in terms of how to make it work in every case, right? Because soybeans are a relatively long season crop. So certainly one of the things is that, um, is that uh, you need to grow, I think, the shortest day bean you can get away with mm -hmm. in, the extreme, in the extreme north so that you can avoid those, those fall frosts. The problem with that scenario is that the beans physically end up be, being quite short, right? And so some of the producers up there have tried to grow longer day beans to get around that. But 2014, uh, things didn't turn out so well, unfortunately, for a lot of those guys. So all that to say is, you know, the basics are still there, narrow rows up north, mm -hmm. you know, um, higher plant populations, get them in as early as you can. But all, all, all I'm really saying is that we don't have all the answers as to how to make it work up there, right? Mm -hmm. Um, in the extreme north right. I'm talking about. Well, I know you're going to be hitting the meeting circuit this winter, and you've got a couple going on this week. Um, uh, we look forward to hearing uh, more on your results and some of the trials and stuff like that, and uh, we'll see you on the road. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.